Good evening, everybody. Hi there, out there, people, folks, stuff. <laughs> Did not plan that. Oh, well. <laughs> well, it's it's great to be live with you guys once again. Uh, thank you for watching on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook. And I hope you're having a wonderful July 6th. We're uh, just coming in out of the holiday weekend. Hopefully you guys have had some safe fireworks fun and ate a lot of food and now you're trying to figure out how you're going to lose that additional weight. But it's okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it because when you're here, you're only from the shoulders up. So no one can see the wonderful midsection you're building. <laughs> why am I even talking about this? Well, if you're wondering why I'm here talking about gaining weight, uh, the reason is because I've, I've been gaining weight sitting – on my keister working on this documentary film that uh, I've been working on it for six months, believe it or not. And okay, your, your first question probably is going to be, is the film done? And the answer to that question is like 98% done. And that may, they may be making you ask, well, what's left to do, Phil? Well, the majority of what I'm doing now is polishing. So I'm cleaning up audio and making sure the levels are correct and making sure that the colors look good. And, um, but I'm also working with music, and that's why we're here tonight. We're here to talk, talk with the musician behind the music for my Batman documentary film. And I'm super excited to be having this conversation live. Of course, if you're watching this after the fact, that's okay, too. Hope you enjoy it. But if you are watching live, I want to remind you that this is an interactive show tonight. So if you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Twitch, if you're watching on Facebook, and you are signed in to those accounts, uh, you can comment live, and I will, I will get to your comments throughout the evening as I am able to. So those are the, the rules. I mean, I guess I really didn't give you any rules. Just, you know, be kind and courteous. I guess that's the rule. And allow, allow me, if you would, uh, to give a brief introduction to my guest this evening. He is a, comp a composer of, of video games and movies and cartoon TV shows. Um, just a, a wide array of subject matters. And uh, I've been aware of him since probably probably since Invader Zim came out, I would say, which was, I want to say, around the 03 mark, 2003, something like that, 2004. Um, and I've been kind of like following his career since then, on, on again, off again with stuff. And uh, he, he's composed for Spider-Man. He's composed for Batman. He's done work for, um, of course, Invader Zim and Generator Rex, which are just awesome shows. So I'm going to play a little bit of his music, and then we'll get to get to talking with, uh, with Kevin Manthe. So here we go. Let's get that going. Please welcome Kevin Manthe. That was a good introduction, right? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> hey, welcome, Kevin. Hey. I was hey. like, I was just thinking about how cool the Duke is and how when you have live players, it really adds so much emotion and drama. What was the name of that, that instrument again? Uh, the Duke. D U D U K. The Duke. Yeah, I believe it's Armenian. Maybe I should be like, the Duke just entered the room. No, I should not say that. No. Well, uh, Kevin, first of all, thanks for giving me a little bit of your time tonight. And, of course, everybody else watching live right now. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
<laughs> I kind of wanted to talk a, a little bit about some of the superhero work you've done specifically tonight, um, because since you know you and I are, are working on a superhero collaboration, it just seemed appropriate. So, uh, what I thought was really interesting, I went back uh, yesterday and I rewatched Batman uh, Gotham Knight. Right. And um, that came out in 2008. And for those who haven't seen the film, it was kind of loosely uh, meant to be a bridge between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. Yeah. Was that something that you pulled into your influences when you were writing the music for the animated film? Not really, because each um, each segment was so different. So... And I knew that, um, I believe the animation studio that did it, uh, at least the segments I did, were anime studios from Japan. So there was a lot of an anime-inspired element. And so one of my ideas, especially with, I believe it was the Crossfire, was to just sort of bring in a really different sound and a, like a very anime sound. Um, so I did that. And um, I knew that the, the Nolan brothers were involved in some way can't remember if they wrote it or whatever um, but they you know they were involved so there was this cohesiveness with the films that were coming out in some regard that's awesome okay I didn't know that they were directly involved in that sense uh, and and yeah so the film is broken up into six segments and right. you, you and two other composers each broke it up into thirds right, right. yeah yeah so I did two. So did you work with the with the directors of those segments like one on one? Uh, we, I just worked. Everyone worked with the same uh, producer at Warner Brothers. So, okay. Yeah, and because um, I, I think the I don't know who directed each one. I, I would imagine there was probably different directors, just like there was different composers. But then you know the showrunner. Um, okay. Bruce Tim. Um, met with composers and just kind of created, you know, helped create that cohesiveness between the six different, um, you know, different segments. Yeah. Crossfire was your first segment, which is a very, uh, I would say, a well, it, it, it's a mafia story, but there's this very right. disturbing element of like being in the, an insane asylum where yeah. the, the inmates have run loose essentially. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just remember I, I created these really interesting loops and like really weird um, modulated um, sort of percolating percussion sounds with like synthesizers. And it just, I it was weird, but I, it just felt right to just have the almost the entire segment just sort of like lay down this track that just continually percolated through the whole thing, which kind of gave it this tension. Um, yeah. throughout. It really didn't let up. There was a few times where it, it let up, but then it was just, you know. No, for sure. It's very percussive, and yeah. it's almost like this, uh, like someone has a, a bunch of needles, and they're just like constantly poking you in the, in the back of the neck a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I was really happy with how that turned out. Um, I mean in a positive way, by the way. <laughs> you know, I like that. I've never been told you know, the music is like needles poking into your neck. But well, I, you know, because it's I, not like a physical, but more like you're you're being you're being reminded that there is something disturbing not too far off. Right, right. Yeah, it keeps you on your keeps you on your toes, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, neither of those what I found was really interesting was neither of the sections you worked on the crossfire and then uh, working through pain, I think is the title of the other section. Um, neither of them are incredibly Batman focused They're, uh The first one is more of a gritty cop story. And then the second one is more of a Bruce Wayne origin story. Yeah. So how did that, how did knowing those things kind of affect the way you were making the sounds for those parts of the film? Um, well, working through pain um, sort of had an Indian, um, like an Eastern Indian kind of flavor. So for me, it's more about like just hitting the right emotions and then also pulling in the right elements that fit 
the story. So for me, it was like the Duduk, some really interesting um, ethnic instruments for the bazaar area, uh, some source music, and then just, um, you know, uh, sitar and other various instruments that just really help sell, um, you know, where you're at, the location. And then using that in a cinematic way to help tell the story. So that's kind of what I was focusing on. But yeah, I mean, in hindsight, when you look back, the, the two segments that I did were not as like classical, classically cinematic feature film wise as some of the other ones in, in, the, sh in the show. They're more subtle, but there's definitely a, a, an intensity in both of those stories, though. I, I think yeah. you captured very well. Cool, thanks. Yeah. What's that? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the terminology, but is it source music? What, what's the term when the music you're writing is the music that the characters are also hearing? Uh, uh, well, what source music is like music that's happening on screen. So if you, yeah, that, that's if, it. So if people walk in, if the characters in the film walk into a bazaar or a marketplace, you know, in some Indian marketplace and, off in the distance, maybe there's a, a band playing music. Yeah. That's, we call that source music. So you just write something that would be appropriate for source, uh, appropriate for the scene. And then when they mix the music, they'll maybe put an EQ on it or put some sort of effect so that, you know, it sounds like it's coming out of the TV or it sounds like it's coming from over there in the distance. Maybe it's a little bit peppered into the left speaker you know, and it sounds, it just kind of mixes in with the crowd noise or whatever. You know, it's, it's We've got how to do it. We got an, another Kevin in the room since there's not enough Kevins already. Uh, Kevin <laughs> Garcia says, also called diegetic music. Uh, never heard the word diegetic. He, right. Kevin must be smarter than me. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's something, as long as it's palatable, I imagine it's something you can. Thank you, Kevin, for being here. Digest later. <laughs> Bad joke. Um, let's. I, I actually want to play a little bit of that source music that you were descri describing from the bazaar, if that's okay. Sure. How much uh, original music from that part of the world did you mentally take in before you wrote that? Well, uh, that's a good question. I, I can't remember. That was a long time ago. My son, I, I always think of 2008 is when my son was born, and he's 13 now, so <laughs> 13 years ago. Um, but the, the woodwind player is Chris Bleth, who, who does amazing work and has worked on just tons of feature films, and you know, it was really awesome to get him in. And, um, you know, these awesome L.A. studio musicians, they'll you, know, you kind of give them some ideas and then they'll just go and vamp on it. So like the bizarre or something like that, it's like, how do I write some kind of weird Middle Eastern melody like that? Um, sometimes it's easier to just say, hey, you know, here's some rhythms and, you know, I'm kind of, we're kind of in this key zone here. I'm thinking of you know, this little motif, you know, and then let them just go crazy with it. Oh, so you do give the musicians a chance to sort of improvise? Improvise? Not. Yeah, we did. We improvised on that. Um, okay. Melodies, usually not, but uh, you just kind of want them to inflect on melodies and that kind of thing. But um, that that's the excitement with working with musicians is when you can say, hey, what do you think? You know? <laughs> Yeah. Well, thankfully it's worked out in your favor because I bet it also turned very badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always tell them what to do, but it's always fun to have that freedom to, you know, collaborate, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, so since, since beyond working on, the, on Gotham night, uh, you made a return to DC comics with uh, justice league, the new frontier. Yeah. Which was a uh, which is a really great movie for those who haven't seen it. It is it is a direct to video similar to Gotham Knight, um, based on a graphic novel of the right. same name. Uh, 
which was uh, written by, uh, now I'm drawing a blank. Dwayne Cook? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it's a period piece. It's like a 1940s era, I would say. You yeah, know, it's been a while since I watched it. Um, it definitely had a period. I'm almost thinking like the 60s because I think there was um, rocket okay. and in like jets and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so like the the direction was that on that was like let's let's do superhero, let's do Justice League. But in this time period, so no modern synths, no percussive loops, no, none of that, you know, sort of modern hybrid kind of sounding stuff. So uh, my inspiration was like Bernard Herrmann and Saul Bass, who um, was uh, the beginning credits were, um, were done in the style of his his credits that he's did in all these amazing feature films back in the, I don't know, I don't know exactly when, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, I, yeah, I just found a lot of inspiration from Bernard Herrmann for my score and um, just sort of these juxtapositions of chords, um, you know, like polytonality, um, like, like a C major chord against an F sharp major chord. You get the, the tritone in there. You get this really interesting, like, chordal uh, sound. It's um, it's major. It's minor. It's dissonant. It's not dissonant. And um, I, I just had so much fun. And then all the characters of Justice League were in there. We had Batman moments. We had Flash. Um, the Martian was in there. And um, gosh, it was it was so much fun. Uh, it, it, it is a fun movie, and that, that is part of the, I think, the joy of it is having all those major members of the Justice League it probably gives you a lot of right. uh, thematic moments. Yeah. yeah, and then I also had um, Jeff Bennell, who's a who's a L.A. Session trumpet player. I had him come, and then I had a woodwind doubler come. And so I just did a lot of live overdubs on the score, which I think really helped because, I mean, it's 13 years ago, but I, I feel like if you listen to the score now, it still feels pretty fresh. Um, yeah. I'm sure the purists will point out little things here and there, but um, Speaking you know, budget-wise, you, budget you don't get to, you don't get to go crazy with full orchestras. So um, I like to bring in the, the live players um, and I did that on that too. So what's Kevin saying? Kevin's saying that it leads. It, it's a it's a '50s era uh, '60s comic book and goes into the early '60s. Yeah, early '60s, I think yeah, he's right. And he does great. I watched it for a long time. Well, Ke I, Kevin Garcia, I believe, is a comics uh, expert. So, so he's oh, okay. yeah. We need the experts. We we need the experts. I sure. Music. I you know I, I have to have people tell me the the backgrounds and stuff. I mean, I like all this stuff, but it gets really wonky quick. <laughs> you know, I've I've watched pieces uh, in the last couple of years, not not necessarily animated, just pieces of film and television, where it is a period piece, but the music musician or the whoever's selecting the music, mm -hmm. it's not if it's not composed, if it's like they're pulling you know pre constructed music, yeah, um, they'll do this thing where they'll take a period piece and they'll mash in a piece of modern music right as a way to juxtapose uh but what you were just describing was trying to keep things very true to that era of americana yeah do you feel like like um do you ever think about going the other direction and doing like the weird uh, yeah i think um like the the justice league the new frontier is a very earnest piece and it was very much grounded in that era so like I don't, there would be really no reason why to ramrod a modern sound into something that is very earnest and true. Um, sometimes, like let's say it's a modern Marvel music or movie, but maybe it's got some throwbacks to earlier eras, or maybe it's an earlier era. But but you but it's done in such a way that it still feels like a modern interpretation of that, and it feels appropriate. So I think it's a it's a case by case basis, and and then the other obvious thing is like I'm it's my job to just do what the producers and 
the creators and the directors are thinking that would work best for their film. So that was that was basically the what I was kind of told was to do more of an honest, you know, fully orchestral kind of take on it. You were just mentioning that you feel like the score for Justice League New Frontier uh, still holds up and has a fresh sound today. Is sure. that an accident? <laughs> well, um, I, what's interesting is when you when you um, reference the past, the past, um, the past. Let's say let's say I did a score and it was all like Skrillex kind of stuff. Like that is so like ten maybe eight to ten years ago. So that it would feel very almost kind of a little bit dated, like a little bit of like maybe 2015 or 2010 or whatever. Versus like when you do something that has a throwback to, you know, the past, whether it's the 1800s, 1700s, you know, Bach or um, just the the early 40s, 50s. It has that sound. So the sound is the sound, and it will always be that sound into the future. Uh, I think the, the problem is when, when you start sounding dated would be when it's maybe only 20 years after you, you know, like when you listen to an 80s, you know, like let's say Beverly Hills Cop, you know, you listen to the, the score for that and it's super awesome, but it's so 80s, right? It is. You're like, and we're only 20, we're, only, we're like 40 years away from the 80s and it, it just feels too close. We're too close to the 80s, so it feels dated. But when you go further back and you you write in a style that's you know much further back, then it just kind of feels like you're using that as an inspiration. Okay. It's like, oh, it sounds dated. Like, what was he thinking? So the um, reference point of the audience is kind of – causing that feeling it's maybe not anything the composer did it's just it's, yeah yeah it's sort of like the reference point of where you're drawing inspiration it's the musical equivalency of going too soon yeah exactly like what okay but what's kind of cool though too is like this whole stranger things thing that's happened and then now everyone all the composers are getting into you know 60s and 70s synthesizers and modular synths and everything is that we've kind of took this whole sound of like the 80s synthesizers and we've kind of twisted it in a modern way and so now um what's really fun is when you in scoring when you're referencing um older styles of music that are recent but then you're doing a, a modern twist on them you're sort of creating a, a new genre of music and a new style and um that kind of 80s synth music is is really popular right now in um, scoring and so now that's even more complicated because now it's 2020 ish and uh we're doing like 80s kind of stuff in 2020 but we're mashing it together and uh so it's it's very fluid i mean it's not you know that's why they call it art <laughs> do you find that you have a I guess if a if a producer or a showrunner, they give you their input, but aside from their input and aside from what you know the piece is supposed to be, do you have a a Kevin Manthe sound that you try to infuse, or does it just happen automatically? It probably just happens automatically. I mean, we're all artists, so we we try to to do. We always, at least I personally, try to take you know, everyone's thoughts and adjectives and ideas of what they're looking for. And I turn that into music and I'm the one turning it into music. So hopefully I have a style or a sound, but I'm doing that along with all, along with what the creators are wanting. And so, you know, I mean, if I was completely generic, it could be like a chameleon and do, you know, every single composer's, sound um it might be good commercially but like what you know am i am i an artist or am i just a big copycat that's definitely a, a danger i'm sure in that in the industry uh kevin garcia has a question for you and he asks uh is there an adjustment where when music starts out in the background 
but becomes source music as the scene shifts or vice versa? Oh, um, so kind of like uh, scores. <laughs> so like score turns into a score turns into source music or source music turns into score. I think that's what he's asking. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's kind of usually a conscious um, decision that's made between like whoever I'm spotting with. Um, sometimes you could do that. Like, let's say there's some jazz piano playing in the background and then you kind of cut to the scene where, you know, the lead, the, 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 the two main characters are maybe having a conversation that's a little romantic and then the, the, the cocktail piano music can kind of start to turn into a little more of a score where it's underplaying their moods and what they're saying. And then sometimes it can obviously even transition fully into score. Other times it can just stay as the cocktail piano going through. Maybe eventually the strings start coming in or woodwinds and it turns into a like a full on score moment. The times that I can think of that are when a, when a movie will use like Moonlight Serenade and it and play it, it full volume and then do that thing you mentioned where they throw a radio effect on it and now it's coming out of a radio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that too. Sometimes um, I love that within uh, shows where. They'll, pl they'll blast music really loud and it's like it's maybe it's an obvious pop song or something and you think it's sort of like the music that's intentionally being played for the film as like maybe a not source music but like the score but it's obviously pop music and then all of a sudden it, there's some sort of cut and you realize it's the person in the car listening to the music or you know and then it, obviously it goes all fuzzy or whatever and yeah. So, yeah, that's that's always interesting too. Yeah, well, good good question there, Kevin Garcia. Appreciate that. Uh, we're gonna shift gears a little bit okay. and talk about your work with with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For, what no, what are we? <laughs> what's that? What are we doing? I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> we're doing something. Um, so so. For those who are watching this and don't know, uh, I, I've been working on a, do a documentary uh, over the last six months, and I've uh, been collaborating with Kevin recently in, in recent weeks. I would say we started really talking about it back in May, or was it April? Probably May, I think. Mostly, mostly yeah. May. We, we might have talked preliminarily in April, but mostly May. Yeah. And... Uh, so a lot of films, I would say, have what, like sixty minutes or more worth of score. Is that a fair it's a thing to say about for sure. movies? Yeah. And uh, what you and I have been working on is decidedly less than that. <laughs> but, right. but um, I guess if I'm asking you questions, stepping outside of myself, outside of the zone of what I already know, yeah, this is hard to do. But I'm going to okay. do it. Um, <laughs> What what kind of a challenge, if any, has it been to um, write so much less music, but have to capture so much of right. the mood of the film? Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good question. Um, Thank you. I tried. So, well, yeah, I like um, what I'm used to doing is just scoring scenes, you know. So. I'm used to like scoring from the very beginning of something and scoring all the way to the very end. But I also do a lot of video game music, which is completely different. Uh, video game music is like, okay, you have this level and you're going to fight a boss and there's an ambient part. And then there's kind of a mid level where it's like, maybe you'll fight some people, but it's not as intense as a boss. And you know, it's volcanic, it's really rocky and there's a lot of lava you know, or it's out, it's open air, it's, it's very sparse. So all those things give you an idea of like what, how to score it and what to do. So the same thing though, actually with your documentaries, I'm kind of thinking in it like a video game. It's like, what are the levels, you know? So we've got like a humorous level where things are lighter on screen. There's maybe some more banter. There's some funny stories being told. We've got, um, more of a just a general kind of 
talking about the nuts and bolts of the show and maybe a little more gravitas, a little more, um, just a little more serious, a little more Batman y, a little more cinematic. And then we've got like the, the opening, which is very cinematic, very like, let's, let's give it a theme. Let's really give it that full Batman treatment. So, so far, those are kind of the, the elements that I've been working on. Um, and I think as, as we go along and as you're in post, we'll be figuring out some more of those sort of levels and like, you know, what are, what are we kind of missing here? And uh, what, what, you know, what do we need to sort of cover? So you're so, kind of like, ambiance scoring, it's kind of like, right? You're doing yeah. ambiance scoring. Ambiance. Yeah, it's like, um, what's interesting about documentaries, and I haven't done a ton of documentaries, but the music doesn't, the music is there to just help support things kind of moving forward and help support what they're, all that dialogue. There's so much dialogue in documentaries, you know, so it's, it's a lot, and, it, and it's just helping sort of bridge all those moments. It's not really, you know, there's no action sequences uh, unless it, you're showing little clips, um, but there's, there's not like huge drama. Um, so the music um, sometimes generally can um, just be a little softer and a little um, less intense, but also keep things moving forward. So those are the those are the things that I've been you know thinking about. Besides, obviously, when we had creative conversations and ideas that you've you had for music. Yeah, we almost need a, a third person here to moderate. Um, <laughs> so well, I guess that's where the, the live audience comes in. If anybody has, uh, if, if they can think of things that I can't think of. Uh, so that's something that I sit there and wonder actually, as I'm working with the music that you've created and I'm deciding how to properly apply it to the film, that I, I often think Okay, well, if I was writing this song, how much freedom would I really feel like I have in creating a melody? Because a melody can be distracting, but at the right. same time, you don't want there to be no melody, right? So there's yeah. like, that's a weird kind of nebulous zone, right? So, uh, yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I did think about melody. And so um, the pieces I've written thus far have moments where it builds into melodic sections and then it there are some, uh, you know, builds and some comes up, comes down. There's moments of melody, and then there's moments where it's not. Um, and then we've also discussed, uh, you know, about having alternate mixes and taking these main big themes and then breaking them down into smaller sub themes or, um, you know, alternate mixes. And so, like, you could just have things percolate and, and just have percussion that's just kind of percolating along underneath at certain times so yeah there's a lot of uh possibilities well that's part of what i i've always appreciated about what you do as a composer in general uh is i i think your percussion builds are are some of the best out there no oh, thank you yeah for sure so like i that's the stuff i think i first noticed that in invader zim you have a lot of that stuff in zim. a lot of percussion in invader zim a lot yeah. of percussion yeah a lot a lot of uh uh just like very steady beat, beat or right. beat moving forward not like a march but like like a there's like a real concern in the audience you know yeah yeah that's cool um so are there things that you because like, again all the pieces that you've done that involve batman not mm -hmm. not not including my film mm -hmm. uh the the times where you've written for batman do you feel like that that has informed you better for working with me or like, are, are there some things that are, you know, cemented in your mind as quintessentially Batman that now no. help <laughs> there aren't? Okay. No, I can't think of anything because Batman has been, there's so many Batmans, you know, there's like I did, um, I did, there's a, a series that was on Nickelodeon called fanboy and chum chum. Okay. And, um, it was inspired kind of loosely by like the very original Batman, more of the comic. What was that one? You know, the very original that I watched as a kid uh, with Batman oh. and Robin and the pow, boom, boom. You oh, know. You mean, yeah, the Adam West Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam West Batman. And like, 
so we were inspired by that for I did the pilot I did the pilot slash um, was it called random cartoons version of that um, and so we were kind of inspired by that so I did that kind of Batman um, and then I did like the super cinematic like you know Bruce Wayne origin story Batman and then I've done Batman and Justice League um, I tried out for a Batman animated or Batman uh, video game. I think it was oh. the Arkham ones. Oh, so close to that, it really sucked. Oh man, that would have been perfect for you. I know I didn't get it, um, but um, I kind of want to hear your tryout music for that sometime. You no, know, I, I do too. I have to dig that up. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, but what you're saying is reminiscent of something I was just I was just watching a couple. Um, Supplemental. Hey, we should use that. We could use that music. In we your, could, cause, yeah, because you haven't used. <laughs> well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to find that and send it to you. Okay, that would be really cool, actually. Uh, but I, I was just watching some supplemental materials from, you know, previous Batman films that I that I own, and um, one of the discussion pieces that was mentioned was that Batman is a great storytelling tool. And that he kind of can, you can put him in various scenarios and change yeah. things around, but he can still, he's still who he is, yeah. but, but things around him can change. That kind of reminds me of what you, what you were just saying. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, th I just feel like Batman is done by so many composers over so many years that when I come to Batman, I just feel freedom to sort of figure out what I think Batman should be based on my own interpretation, but also the interpretation of the director and showrunner that I'm working with. So I, I, there's a lot of freedom in that, you know, in, in basing it in the here and now is what you yeah. mean. Yeah. There's a lot of freedom. Well, that's good. <laughs> well, that, I was going to ask you, cause that kind of feeds into my other question, which was, yeah. I feel like we have to mention Danny Elfman and Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Um, well, I love I love what they both did. I mean, I think they're both incredibly awesome. What's yeah. so fun? Have you ever played the Lego Batman? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Like it's so fun to be playing Lego Batman, but you're listening to this like just epic Danny Elfman score. Yeah, and it's. I don't want to say that it diminishes the score, but it's just it's kind of fun in like a. Just a fun. It's fun. In a, it's fun in a cinematic way. It's cinematic, but it's also just really fun because you're like playing Batman and little Lego guys running around. Um, it's almost out of context at that point. Almost, yeah, it's a little weird, but I but it, but it kind of works. And I was like, I remember trying to get those jobs, like trying to be like, oh, I want to score those, sh you know, those games. And they're like, well, it's kind of hard to, you know, go up against these guys who are licensing their <laughs> the original. Right. Batman scores from the movies. So, oh, so were they considering going with a, a, a new music? I don't even remember. I, I think I tried to reach out a few times. To okay. Speak. Well, so that the question I was going to ask you in regards to like Danny and Hans is obviously as a composer, you want to write something that is just so distinct and memorable, but also you don't want to detract from the film. You want it to add, it, it, that's such a weird uh, zone to be in. But what, when you have a, have scores like the ones that those gentlemen have done, uh -huh. is it intimidating to be like, no, I'm going to do the character, and you're supposed to forget everything you know about what you've already heard in cinema? When you yeah. Hear about well, of course that's intimidating. That's why I don't think about it. I just, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just do what I want to do, and I, I just try to make the producers happy, and I try to make myself happy. You know, I, I think a lot of times um, – like when great art is created, it's the, the people making the great art don't always realize they're making it at the time. And because they're just in the zone, they're just trying to do what they do. And so if I sit here and, and worry about is my music, you know, as good as Hans Zimmer or Danny's or, or whatever, it's like, yeah, it's probably not, but <laughs> that doesn't matter. They didn't get hired to do the thing that I'm doing that needs a Batman theme. I have to figure that out. So, I don't really care. I just, I, I do me and I make my client happy and I, I, I want to feel creative and have fun doing it. Well, I can tell you've already been having fun with, with the music for my film and I'm already very happy with it. So, yeah. so that's, a, that's a success in my book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's really important to, you know, just to, to really forget all that external stuff 
like you want to you you want to be doing all that you want to be knowing you want to know all this stuff right you want to know and pay attention to movies and and understand all the things that are going on um, in in the cinematic universe and TV and all that. But then when it comes down to you sitting in a room, you know, with your keyboard and you've had a spotting session with the director and the producers, you have to let all that go. And you just have to forget about all that stuff, not worry about all that stuff. And you just need to do you, you know, and that's where you can create your own thing. Um, but if I'm just like, oh, my God, I have to write something that's as good as Danny Elfman. <laughs> or, you know, now if I'm told to, to channel Danny Elfman, then I have to think about, then I have to think about whatever it is right. what or whatever and kind of be inspired by that. But otherwise, it's, I don't know, I, I just feel like my job is to tell the story that I'm seeing on screen and... I do that with the intentions of the producer and directors. And then, and then I see where it takes me. A lot of times the music tells me where to go. I don't tell it where to go. So in, I, I guess with my film, but also with, with yeah. other, other projects you've done, yeah. do you, do you find that like, once you have, let's say you've figured out a main theme or, or something like that, once you have that, does it make writing the other themes kind of click in place a lot easier because now you have a guide? Sometimes. Um, but what's interesting about themes is like generally they'll be very different from one another. So you may have unlocked like the theme for the main character um, and a sound, but then the villain might have a completely different sound and a different, a whole different mindset. So, um, but I would say that um, once you kind of unlock a couple of different themes, and then you kind of have a template of sort of a sound for the show. That's always nice. And then you can kind of, you know, just jump in and then, but like every episode seems to dictate its own episodic themes and episodic sound, which is really fun. Like the last season of um, Marvel Spider-Man that I worked on Venom was really big, but it was like this Venom seed and it was like this more of a sci-fi, um, Venom as an alien and oh my gosh it was so much fun just I created a lot of my own original sounds and samples and just went crazy with it yeah for the people out there who don't know and they definitely should follow you on Instagram uh, which is, is isn't it just Kevin Manthe music yeah uh, Kevin Manthe music on Instagram I've, I've seen some of your stories when you'll um, you'll kind of let people into your creative profit process and show yeah. them when you're when you're using weird things that would not normally be associated with music. Right. And you're you're doing like sound sourcing and things like that, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've created a few different instruments myself with springs, and um, I like to just manipulate sounds and kind of create different sound sets for each project. Um, What's the so, name of one of those musical instruments you've made? Uh, you know, I have different names depending on my mood, but um, <laughs> that one over there and this one over here. Yeah, um, I, I, ha I, if it was right next to me, I would go grab it, but it's in the other room. I have oh. some different. I think I can't remember Spring Monster or something like that. I had a better name than that, um, but yeah, it's really fun. So sometimes I'll bow them and sometimes I'll scrape them. And um, I was even inspired. I was grilling like about a month ago. I was gr grilling on my barbecue and I was <laughs> banging on it a little bit. I was like, wow, that's like kind of a really cool sound. So I have a bunch of different little audio recorders, handheld stereo recorders. Went back there and just banged on a bunch of stuff. Of course, I didn't just bang on the grill and I started banging on tables and chairs and and I got, um, even in between all the roosters crowing, which is super annoying, I got a lot of interesting sounds. Um, and then what I like to do is pitch up and down those sounds. So you could take all that source material. Um, I, you can't see the keyboard behind me, but if I have everything right here on this octave, I can just instantly switch it down an octave. And then it's like all that source material that you, is very familiar to you, those clangs, they're suddenly an octave lower. So... 
also when when Stomp goes around uh, for auditioning new members, you are already ready for that. I have I have bad rhythm, so I don't. <laughs> you have bad rhythm? Well, not not the greatest rhythm. I'm not I'm not like drummer rhythm, uh, so that's a little. But you are a musician. Do you, how do you have bad rhythm? In, <laughs> be well, musician? I don't have horrible rhythm. I just you know those guys have awesome rhythm. They're like drummers. Those guys are like metronomes. They're walking. Yeah, metronomes. right. I'm not a metronome. Yeah, that, that that's pretty fair. So so how do you know? Like when you're making an instrument. How do you know that you don't already have in your arsenal the tools to make that sound and you're like, you know what? I just have to go make a thing that does this. Uh, that's a good question. Well, well let's, let's take, um, let's take like piano. Um, you know, the inside of a grand piano, there's all the strings and you can like scrape them and ding them. And it's like a harp yeah. in there. Isn't it? Kind yeah. of. I mean, you can do all these kind of cool aleatoric kind of sounds. And I have tons of libraries of stuff like that, but it's kind of cool to have your own. So sometimes it's like, okay, I kind of have this stuff, but I'll just do what I want to do with it. Um, and I've done a lot of sampling with my, my two girls. Um, one plays violin and viola and the other one plays cello. Oh, I, I was worried you were going to tell me you, you're hitting things on them to make sounds. <laughs> no. So I record them in my scoring stage and, um, we just did scrapes and rips and uh, minor second trills and sol, sol ponticello um, sounds and um, just tremolos and just all kinds of like things that I really haven't heard in libraries. And just because I can sit there and say, okay, well, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's try this. And then I've had some uh, cellists come out and, and do that. I have a friend who's a great cellist and, um, we've done some various things and then I, I like to take source material too and then manipulate it with different effects and uh, different things and then I, it's just it's kind of a fun way I think it's a good way to sort of create your own original voice with your music yeah just kind of create your own sounds and you know. speaking of original voice have you I know you you've used your own singing yeah You've manipulated that for Invader Zim. Yeah. Yeah, which I just um, – so I'm putting together some suites of Invader Zim music, um, basically music in score order from every episode, and I'm preparing it for YouTube. So my daughter oh, wow. was helping me out with that today. So if you go onto my Instagram right now today on my stories, you'd be able to see that. So um, for whatever reason, I had to do a lot of singing on Invader Zim. <laughs> and um, I enjoyed pitching my voice up either, you know, up an octave or two or down an octave. Um, Cause I'm not really a great singer, but, um, but that works for the yeah. show. For those who haven't seen Invader Zim, yeah. your, your singing adds a level of dementedness that I think fits perfectly in with that series. Yeah, and I wish that show had been SAG because I would have made a lot of money. <laughs> Well, that, that's true. So you don't get paid any extra for that, huh? Well, no, just like royalties for the, the music itself. But Oh, okay. All right. Remember. So every every few months, there's a five-cent check coming in the mail. From uh, so like every quarter, it's like BMI, ASCAP, SOCAN. Uh, uh, SOCAN is Canada. What's the CSAC? Well, I know for the for the Enter the Florpus movie, which for those who have not watched Invader Zim, Enter the Florpus, it is available yeah. on Netflix. And it's really beautifully animated. Um, I, I would say that the the piece is nice part, part of the film is a very good example of what you've done with your voice. Well, so I'll tell you about piece is nice. That was a children's choir. Um, so I did not sing on piece is nice. Oh, you, okay. Your voice is not on piece is nice. No, okay. it's actually a children's choir. I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, well, I thought you were singing with them or something. I don't know. No, I, no. I think I like on a demo I did, but no, you. You don't hear my voice. So it's actually my kids with um, some other kids of a friend of mine who's a musician. And then I, I, I um, in my scoring stage, I had them <clears throat> stand in different places so that we'd get this really full stereo sound. And we just multi-tracked like, I don't know, six, six seven times. So it sounds like really big. Um, yeah, it does. It's, it sounds like a full. full and then I realized um, after the session that I had um, – 
I had written out the lyrics wrong for one of the sessions because I had two sessions, one with just my kids and then one with the other kids. And I think I said, peace is nice, chicken and rice or something. I, I mixed it up a little bit. So I was like, oh, my God, they, they sing it all like half wrong. And But you know what? You couldn't even tell. And then I like chopped off a little bit at the beginning. So it took off some of the syllables and it's okay. So, but now everybody knows because I'm telling the story. Yeah, but no one's going to go. <laughs> but, but the funny thing about that too is um, Ricky, who's the voice of Gurr, we, we did a session with him over at Nickelodeon for him to sing because Gurr sing, starts singing Pieces Nice in the beginning and he sings it really bad, like to like sort of 8 bit music so i had to do like a really bad rendition of pieces nice before it really becomes nice and um because they pitch his voice up in the sessions well because in the in the final recording they always pitch his voice up so we had to do this complicated calculation of like well we had to pitch my music down in order for him to sing to it with his normal voice so that when they pitch it up it would fit it would fit the 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 right music and <laughs> we're all scratching our heads and then um just yeah he doesn't have great pitch so he would, <laughs> we just did over and over of um different takes and it was just it was it was probably the highlight of scoring this show was just sitting in that session working on trying to get ricky to to sing pieces nice as, well, as I, were good enough so that it was bad <laughs> i mean it's appropriate that it was a highlight because it's a major part of the film. It's kind of a big climax moment. Yeah. Of and um, just to, just so you know, too, Jonan uh, sang the, they, they gave me this terrible recording. I don't know why, but I think they manipulated the audio so that it was sort of non-pitched, but he, he came up with the melody and then I just, I took the melody and did all the arrangements on it. Um, and my first version was, it sounded like out of Home Alone, like John Williams Home Alone. Yeah, <clears throat> which I wanna I wanna post that at some point because it sounds just really beautiful and yeah, uh, like Christmassy. And he's like, no, 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 I don't want it beautiful and Christmassy. I want it like a, a big anthem, like these kids are singing in the middle of like a baseball anthem, you know, baseball field, and it's just this big triumphant anthemy kind of vibe. So. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I guess I missed missed, <laughs> missed that. <laughs> what what uh, would you say over over the years of working with Jonah, though, that you eventually developed more of a shorthand? Well, I, I think we did by the end of Invader Zim for sure. But then you know, nineteen years <laughs> went by. Yeah, yeah, it was it was we definitely um, started back up where we left off. Was it really um, nineteen years later? Yeah. So, like you said, 2003, but um, it was 1999, 2000. When oh, was it, was it really? Yeah. yeah, it was my first animated show that I worked on. And, you know, wow, so, I don't know why I placed it so. Like, well, because um, some of the episodes, like they, they held on to and they didn't actually release them until 2003, 2004. So, if you look right. online when it was released, yeah. it would say those dates, but it was really all done in 99, 2000. Okay. In 2001, like the very last episode was the Christmas episode, the most horrible Christmas ever. Okay. It was the very last episode that was. Uh, Why did I think it was t like Tack, the hide hideous girl? Mm, that was probably one of the more later ones. But yeah. Yeah, the Christmas episode was the very last. Okay. All right. <laughs> you, you've also done, a, uh, you mentioned the video game stuff. You've done a, a bunch of video games. Isn't there like a. Aren't you composing for like a Magic the Gathering video game? Yeah, so it's called Magic Legends, and it was just announced. Um, I shouldn't laugh because it's sad, but it was just announced that they they decided to kind of stop. Basically, it was in beta. But, Wait, uh, it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, what? It was, yeah. It was announced maybe last week. So, oh, I'll, I didn't. I'm sorry. I, I, didn't... Read that, I read that on LinkedIn. One of the one of the persons working on the game. I was like, oh. Okay. No one told oh, me. That. That's all. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Well, so I wrote additional music. I had, um, I, I wrote one major section of the game and was hoping to do more, you know, as it was going along and after it had been uh, released. So, yeah, it really sucks. Yeah. And obviously, there was like 70 people that were working there that 
got laid off. You know, oh, but, geez, you know, it like, ended up being a business decision for Cryptic too. I wonder if maybe maybe someone else will swoop in there and be like picking it up instead. Seems like there's a lot of work out there, so yeah, we'll see. Well, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, people can. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you, were you well, asking? My music. I actually posted it on my SoundCloud, so if people want to listen to what I wrote. It's it's up there. So where? So what? How do people find your SoundCloud? What's the? Um, I guess I would go to SoundCloud and type in Kevin Manthe or Kevin Manthe Music, M A N T H E I. Probably good advice to do it that way. Yeah. Look at my my name keeps going past. So, <laughs> well, it's also right on your picture too. It's on my picture too. Yeah. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. So. Um, um, I got a lot of music up on SoundCloud. Yeah, you you have a lot on your official website as well, which is kevinmanthesmusic dot com. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Manthes, a lot of Kevin Manthes. <laughs> Try to keep it simple. I'm on uh, Facebook, Kevin Manthe Music. Same with Twitter is just at Kevin Manthe, and uh, Instagram's Kevin Manthe Music, and then I think SoundCloud is Kevin Manthe Music. So, okay. And then your your next project is, I guess, the one with 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 me, right? That's your next. Yeah, so I'm working on your thing. Um, I've been working on Veggie Tales reboot, which has been really really fun. Just super high energy Pixar action adventure music. In fact, they hired me to do a few episodes that are superhero based. So I'm doing, oh. um, oh, what do they call the League of Incredible Vegetables? Is what they call themselves. <laughs> Um, so actually, I'm um, like you know, just to show you how you can be on this side and this side of hero and the hero sort of format is um, for the League of Incredible Vegetables. We're doing full on like '90s, '80s, '90s rock with some orchestral overtones. It was very cheesy and fun, and uh, my guitar player loves has been you know throwing down some mad solos and whatnot so it's really fun um that's awesome yeah and then um i just finished um scoring a bunch of episodes for a show called villainous which is a cartoon network uh latin america show which okay. um, is also on youtube so if you search villainous on for youtube the there are millions and millions of hits it's on it's um it's spanish and english so there's different Versions, oh, cool. yeah. So it's uh, multilingual. How do you spell it? Villainous, like the word villain, and oh, V I L L A I N O U S. It's like the actual word, right? Got yeah, it. The actual word. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's created by Alan Iterio, who's an amazing artist and creator, and he's out of Mexico City. So it's really been fun working with him because we'll just do Skype. And you know what? Skype sounds way better than telephone. <laughs> Every time I go on a Skype call, I'm like, wow, this is like a miracle. It sounds so good. You sound like you're literally in the next room over. And so it has been not a challenge at all working with someone that far away. It's actually felt like we're just, you know, it's been good. Do you, do you have another plan for working with uh, live musicians, musicians, musicians <laughs> and for any projects well, coming up? Sure. Um, I just need to get a... a you know, I just need to have producers and directors understand that it's important and want to want to um, give a little bit of money towards that because I can't take my um, creative fee and just dump it all into musicians if you know what I mean because because I have to I have expenses you know <laughs> I have kids in college oh well that makes sense <laughs> yeah so um, sure I mean I, I love to do that when it when it presents itself I have this beautiful scoring stage here ready to you know, I can fit 15 to 18 players in it and I've got a drum room. I could have a couple more people out in the, my studio lounge and the drum room. So I'm set, you know, yeah. Studio lounge too. Man, I got, I got a lounge. <laughs> if I had a studio lounge and I was a composer, I would just have my music playing in the lounge on the loop. <laughs> I don't, want, I don't want to listen to my music. Over there. <laughs> well, you would, you wouldn't be in the lounge. You'd be working. In the right. I could have a DJ. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kevin, this, it's been really awesome talking to you tonight, of course, and uh, thanks for all of the great insight into your process and some of your previous projects and your upcoming projects, and I hope people take a moment to 
uh, check you out on social media, including your YouTube channel, because that's where you're going to be. Yeah, Kevin all Manthe the Music. Yeah, was that what is it? It's Kevin Manthe Music. <laughs> oh, that's, I can't believe that that's what it is. That's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for being here, and I, I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for watching tonight. Uh, thanks for your questions. Thanks for you know, uh, sharing this video with friends. And if you're wondering when the Batman documentary will be coming out, well, that's a very good question. I don't have an answer for you on a release date just yet, but just keep watching uh, my social media accounts. I've got a little uh, link tree link in the bottom there. You can find out more about the film there. You can support it if you feel like throwing money at it. And uh, the release date will be announced very soon. I'm hoping sometime this month, uh, this month of July, 2021 that we're in. So thank you again for watching and please feel free to share this video with all your friends and family and neighbors and, and then, you know, watch it again yourself. <laughs> See you guys next time I do another stream. Have a good night.